Welcome to part five of the Pandemic Preparedness course here at biodefense.com. Feel free to share this page, download the MP3 file, share the file. We've got to educate people to save lives. My name is Mike Adams. I'm the health ranger, the editor of naturalnews.com. And in this section of the Pandemic Preparedness course, we're covering the medical response to a pandemic. Uh, this is crucial because most people in society today believe that if they have a medical problem, they should go to the hospital. And they just call 911, right, and have an ambulance sent over, and then they go to the hospital, doctors take care of them. End of story, right? That's what most people believe. Well, in a pandemic, hospitals become the hubs of spreading disease. Why? Because everybody who's infectious goes to the hospital and then spreads the disease to the medical staff, to the doctors who then spread the disease to patients. So hospitals become actually pandemic distribution and multiplication centers. But most people don't understand that, so they rush to go to the hospital anyway because they don't know what else to do. Uh, sadly, that is the case. So in uh, countries in West Africa right now, every single hospital bed is occupied. People are driving around looking for hospital beds. They aren't available. So people are being sent home. And unfortunately, uh, most people don't know what to do to take care of themselves medically at home for the very reasons that I've just covered, because everybody's been taught that your doctor is responsible for your health, not you as an individual. And that's very dangerous for society as a whole. It's one of the dangers of the, um, the current medical system, which really takes power and responsibility away from patients and doesn't, doesn't teach patients things that they need to do to protect their own health. So let's suppose that there is a pandemic in North America, in the United States, and the major cities are impacted by it. The hospitals will be quickly overrun, very quickly overrun. Sure, the CDC was able to handle a handful of doctors in, in their facility, I think, what, at Emory uh, University in Atlanta. They were able to handle a few doctors who were infected. What was it, three, maybe four? They're not going to be able to handle 3,000, 4,000, much less 3 million. And how many people could be infected in America in a full-blown pandemic? It could easily be millions. If you have a population of 300 million and you have an infection rate of just 1%, you've got 3 million people right there. There are not 3 million hospital beds in America. And by the way, most hospitals in America don't have isolation units. So you don't have a way to contain the spread of the virus even when you're in uh, even when you're treating uh, patients in these hospitals. Now, to really understand the medical response, you also have to understand how Ebola spreads. There's a lot of disinformation about this. You got a lot of people out there who are saying, well, and this is true in the media and some medical experts saying, well, Ebola can only spread if you share body fluids. Uh, that's absolutely not true. And here's, here's why. Ebola exists in all your body fluids, your blood, your saliva, mucous membranes, and so on. Anywhere that that fluid touches, including mucus in your lungs that you cough into aerosol particles that float around in the air, anywhere that these particles touch then becomes a surface that is contaminated with Ebola virus. And previous studies have clearly shown that Ebola virus can live on surfaces for many, many days. And under some conditions, Ebola uh, such as freezing conditions, Ebola can live for, in fact, years or even decades. And when I say live, I use that term loosely. Uh, viruses are not alive. They are not functioning cellular organisms. They are, in fact, strands of genetic code. Uh, so they're, they're not even really alive, uh, which actually makes them more resilient. For example, you can't kill a virus with the same kind of antibacterial chemicals that you would use to kill um, a bacteria. For example, so uh, keep that in mind that viruses are not alive. They, are, they, they don't replicate through mitosis, for example, like bacteria strains do. Uh, uh, viruses invade your cells and, and overtake your cells' genetic reproduction programming. It's, it's actually a cellular hack that's taking place. That's why viruses uh, can survive so long out in the, in, in the wild, in the, in the open air or on surfaces. So someone riding in a taxi cab, as we've already seen in the news, can infect the surfaces inside the taxi cab with Ebola virus. Simply, maybe they cough on their hand, and then they use their hand to touch the taxi cab door handle. Now the door handle is carrying the Ebola virus. 
someone else comes along, the next customer touches the handle, gets Ebola on their hand, and then oh, they wipe the corner of their mouth or they wipe the corner of their eye, they have something in their eye, they scratch their eye, now the Ebola virus is uh, in their eye and they're infected. It's, it's over. But the other thing that can happen is that patients who have Ebola can uh, create aerosols. So a lot of health experts say, well, Ebola is not transmissible through the air. It's not an airborne virus. Uh, well, that's not exactly true. Um, there can be a lot of things in the air that can carry Ebola. For example, uh, spit aerosol, you know, uh, someone coughing uh, creates a plume of, of spit or mucus uh, in the air and that can carry Ebola. So it really can be airborne for short distances. Uh, in addition, Ebola can exist on dust particles that are flying around in the air. So if let's say someone touches a surface, it has some dust on it, and then someone else comes along and, and disturbs that surface and makes that dust circulate in the room, well, that dust can carry Ebola and that can infect you as well. Uh, finally, also in terms of infection vectors, Ebola patients sadly suffer tremendously and they often go into convulsions during their final stages of, of being overcome by the virus. It's a very painful uh, uh, progression of disease. It's very sad that that this even exists at all because uh, none of us want to see humans suffer. Uh, nevertheless, when, when they do in their final stages, they will tend to convulse uh, almost as if they're uh, undergoing seizures, which in fact they are in many cases. What's happening during these convulsions is that the patient's body is literally flinging uh, both blood and uh, mucus or saliva uh, all around the room. And in many cases, that room contains a nurse or a physician, a doctor who, or a family member who is trying to treat that patient. And this is why Ebola spreads so quickly in Africa because the doctors who are trying to treat the patients uh, quickly get infected by the, the patient's uh, convulsions that then fling body fluids around the room. Remember, Ebola causes open wound bleeding uh, all, all over your body. And so uh, I'm, I'm trying not to be too graphic here, but uh, I think you get the picture. Um, convulsions flinging blood around the room. Not not a pretty sight, but also a major in, infection vector of the virus. This is one of the reasons that the virus is, quote, successful from uh, uh, an evolutionary epidemiology standpoint because of this, uh, this it causes people to convulse. For the same reason that, that respiratory viruses are successful when they cause people to sneeze and cough. Uh, the coughing is a, a vector for spreading a mechanism, if you will, for spreading the disease. So now that you understand that, uh, and I apologize if, the, if those images were gruesome, but we are trying to deal with the reality of the situation here. This is the reality. Now that you understand that, you understand why hospitals are such a dangerous place to go to in, in a, a pandemic outbreak. Doctors and hospital staff are horrible at preventing uh, disease transmission in the hospital. And the way we know that that's true is because we already have an epidemic of superbugs spreading all over U.S. hospitals. We already have doctors that will inadvertently spread infectious disease from one patient to another because they fail to wash their hands. Studies have shown that doctors will tend to carry drug-resistant bacteria on their ties. You know, their shirt tie, the tie that hangs down, uh, maybe they lean over a patient to examine the patient, their tie touches the patient, picks up the superbug, then they go over to the next patient, one room down the hallway, they lean over that patient, the tie now deposits the superbug on that second patient. So the doctor's own tie is in fact spreading the disease. And you can spread these, these uh, infectious agents with a stethoscope that a doctor might have around, or what's very common is just on the doctor's hands. And this is why doctors, nurses, and medical staff are very strongly encouraged to just wash their hands before touch, touching patients. Uh, unfortunately, the failure rate of this is very high uh, because hand washing takes a considerable amount of time to conduct properly. It's not five seconds with soap and water. It's really more like a, a 60 to, to 120 second procedure to very carefully wash your hands in the way that a surgeon might wash his hands before surgery. That's the only way to be really, really clean about it. So you almost have to be a clean freak, as they say, 
to, to really have clean hands when you're around superbugs. And in this case, we're only talking about bacteria, not even viruses, which can be a lot more difficult to control because they're smaller and they're easier uh, to be picked up by patients. So you, you should know at this point that, that hospitals are really terrible at preventing disease transmission. There's another important point about this, and that is that hospitals are also terrible at giving you any kind of treatment that's going to help you overcome uh, an, if, an infection with Ebola or even some other pandemic virus that we don't know about yet. At best, what these hospitals can offer you is what's called, quote, supportive care, which really consists of keeping you hydrated, giving you IV fluids and electrolytes, and very simple type of procedures like that. Now, these procedures have some value. I'm not, I'm not saying they're worthless, but they're, they're very minimal in, in their ability to do anything for you. The truth is that anyone who has so far overcome Ebola has done it themselves. Their body cured the disease. Their immune system rose to the occasion and saved their lives. There's no doctor that ever saved anyone from Ebola. There's no hospital. There's no drug. There's no vaccine that ever saved anyone from Ebola. It's never happened in the history of the world. Survivors of Ebola are people who saved themselves, people whose immune systems saved themselves. So, sure, you can go to a hospital and you can get supportive care, but that is of real marginal value in terms of, of beating the disease. In truth, hospitals can in many ways be uh, immunosuppressive. For example, the, the hospital food is atrocious. Hospitals can expose you to other airborne infectious agents that can also there, uh, thereby add a burden to your immune system. The hospital ventilation systems can be full of mold spores, for example, that can further compromise your immune system. And again, at the hospital, you have the risk of being exposed to other superbugs. So going to the hospital is something that you should very, very carefully think about the advantages and the disadvantages in a pandemic outbreak. Chances are, however, that you probably are not even going to be able to get a bed at a hospital because they're all going to be completely full and they're going to send you home to either die at home or live at home. Whatever, whatever your fate happens to be, whatever your body does is, is what's going to determine what happens to you. The doctor has very little, very little control over your outcome in cases of Ebola. So, the medical system in America, the Western medical system, will very quickly go into what, uh, what they call a medical triage system, where they will only take the patients that look the worst, and as the hospitals become overwhelmed with Ebola patients, they will tend to just send people home, send people away, and, and, and you know sometimes they might be able to set up tents outside in the parking lot and handle uh, a few hundred more patients or maybe a few thousand more patients in a large hospital but it doesn't really change the outcome. You know, there's only so much that a doctor can do for a patient. In my opinion, I think you have a better chance at home using natural antiviral medicines. And I will go through the list of that in one of the upcoming sections, but there are many, many antiviral natural medicines such as uh, black elderberry extract and even basil herbs. Uh, echinacea is very powerful. The star anise herb in Chinese medicine has very strong, very potent uh, antiviral capabilities. Vitamin D also helps activate the antiviral potential of the immune system. Zinc is a great mineral that's crucial for antiviral activity in the body. There's, so there are a lot of things that you can do. Now, are any of these absolutely proven to beat Ebola? Well, the truth is nothing is proven to beat Ebola. No, nothing, nothing on the planet. Uh, the, the, just the studies haven't been done. But you're far better off going home and working with a broad spectrum of plant-based antivirals than sitting in a hospital while your doctor drags his tie over your arm, infects you with MRSA while the hospital's poisoning you with processed genetically modified food laced with aspartame and MSG and sends you a bill for it if you live. I mean, that is not a really good uh, uh, roll of the dice for staying alive. Now, you might think uh, if things get really bad, you could call for an ambulance or you could call for a medical evacuation airlift helicopter to come pick you up. Well, it's not going to take long before all the ambulance drivers and ambulance operators are themselves either out of the game or exposed and in the hospital or dead from the pandemic. Even if that's not the case, 
the inside of the ambulance is probably going to be one of the most dangerous places to, to ride anywhere because it's going to be infected just like the inside of a cab. So think twice about stepping inside an ambulance or any, any common transport vehicle that's been transporting patients who are infected in a pandemic. Same thing with a helicopter. The helicopter pilots, believe me, they're not going to be interested in transporting uh, people who are convulsing and flinging blood all over the inside of the helicopter. That's not going to go over very well with helicopter pilots who, uh, by the way, are a pretty risky bunch of guys to begin with. Uh, they, you know, anyone who flies a helicopter has definitely got a, um, a, a high tolerance of risk, but even those people are not going to fly again when they see uh, patients convulsing in their helicopter and, and throwing blood all over the walls. Uh, believe me, they're going to be out of the game very quickly after that scenario unfolds. So overall, you've got to get your head around the idea that you are going to be responsible for your recovery in most pandemic scenarios. The government is probably not going to have any way to help you, and the medical system won't have any way to help you either. So what do you need in order to survive? Well, you need supportive care. So you obviously need an environment where you're not going to be suppressed. You're, you're not going to have your immune system suppressed with other attacks. So you want an environment where you're not around anyone else who is sick. You don't want to have, let's say, a flu infection on top of an Ebola infection. That combination might be fatal. So you don't want to be out in public places for lots of reasons, including the fact that you don't want to infect somebody else. So isolate yourself, stay home, but get the proper care, which means good hydration, good quality nutrition. And my suggestion, and I have to put this in the experimental category because this isn't clinically proven, but what I would do in my case, if I were infected with Ebola, I would be loading up on vitamin D and I would be taking 10,000, 20,000 I use a day for a few days, although you wouldn't want to do that long term because that could be uh, somewhat toxic long term because it's a fat soluble vitamin. But in the short term, it could be very, very helpful. Uh, I would be taking some minerals, zinc and selenium. I would be, even though uh, colloidal silver is not at all proven to uh, eliminate um, Ebola infections, I would still be drinking it anyway, uh, just because it might help. I mean, who, who knows? <laughs> what's, what, what's it going to hurt? Drinking a little silver for a couple of days is not going to hurt anything, and it actually might help you. But I would also load up on things like what's called Sambucol, which is a black elderberry extract. I would really load up on echinacea and golden seal, basil, already mentioned ginger, garlic is really powerful. I could do a lot with garlic. Now, you know, I have to say as a disclaimer, if you decide to do any of these things, I strongly urge you to work with a naturopathic physician who's licensed in your state or country to practice medicine. I think that uh, you need you need some hand holding by a medical expert, a naturopath preferably, who who can help understand your particular situation. You might have health issues that require some special considerations. You might not want to combine some of the things that I just mentioned. So you're going to need to work with a naturopath, in my opinion. If there is no naturopath available and you're just winging it, well, you got to do the best you can with what you have. We know that everybody needs to stay hydrated. We know that, that some sunshine helps people. We know that fresh air is good for people. We know that vitamin D is good for people. We know that a healthy diet is good. You don't want to be eating fried foods. You don't want to be loading up on a bunch of cheese and dairy and things that stagnate your body. Probably juicing would be a good idea. Get some fresh juice into your body on a daily basis. That's, that's a, a common sense kind of approach to just supporting your ability to save your own life using your immune system. Now, I will, for the first time, plug something in this course the Natural News Store is found at store.naturalnews.com, and what we are known for around the world is really relevant to this. We have our own ICPMS laboratory, that's atomic spectrometry, and I'm the lab director. Everything that we sell out of that store is laboratory tested to be extremely low in heavy metals. Uh, I've been one of the pioneering food researchers to, to document the presence of toxic heavy metals in superfoods. We found 2.4 parts per million uh, cadmium, for example, in organic rice protein. We found 
um, uh, lead in rice protein. We found lead in cacao. We've found lead in mangosteen powders, which are super fruit powders from Thailand. Uh, we've identified a, a lot of heavy metals, including tungsten in some rice proteins. So we don't sell anything unless it's extremely low in heavy metals. We have, we're very stringent about this. Why this is relevant to you is that heavy metals suppress your immune function. So you have to be careful if you're in an environment or, or scenario where you want to have superfoods nutrition. Let's say you want to eat chlorella or spirulina or astaxanthin, cacao, you know, any, any of these other types of superfoods. You want the benefits of that, but you don't want the toxic heavy metal burden because that will suppress your immune system. So Natural News Store is the place to go in the world where we have laboratory validated every single thing that we manufacture and that we sell. We're certified organic, we're laboratory verified, and we're FDA compliant with what's called good manufacturing practices or GMP. So uh, if you want to support us and help us fund more public education efforts like this course, uh, you can do so by shopping at store.naturalnews.com. You can get a lot of great products there, including a turmeric, which is an outstanding spice with many, many beneficial properties. Uh, there's colloidal silver from uh, one supplier there that we carry. There's a, lo a lot of superfoods, ultra clean chlorella, the cleanest on the planet, and many other superfoods. So thank you for your support there if you decide to support us in that way. Now, do any of these superfoods uh, treat or cure Ebola? Well, we have no way to know that. And I'm not going to make a claim like that that I can't back up. The, the truth is, as I said earlier, there's no substance on the planet that has been clinically and scientifically validated to cure Ebola. And this includes the experimental Ebola drugs that are being given to people right now by the, the drug companies. Uh, and, and the experimental vaccines that are going to be coming out, they're not going to be proven either. So the truth is nothing is proven to uh, kick Ebola out of your body. Uh, so... Right now, everything is in the category of experimental medicine, everything, whether it's a pharmaceutical, a vaccine, an herb, a nutrient, maybe an IV, a vitamin C therapy. You know, there might be some naturopaths that would give you that to see if that helps. But everything is in the experimental category right now because no one knows what works against Ebola. There hasn't been a global outbreak that has given the world the, the experience of finding out what works and what doesn't work. And so because of this, I always find it fascinating and just a great example of doublespeak when you see the mainstream media or doctors saying, oh, that herb, <laughs> that's unproven. That's unproven. And, and, and then they talk about, well, their vaccine, uh, it might work, even though it's also unproven. It's all experimental. But they're, they're so funny and contradictory in their thinking. They think that their drugs and their vaccines it's okay to use them when they're unproven because they believe that they're going to work. In other words, they have faith in their vaccines. It's not science, it's faith. But they say, well, natural medicine and herbs, well, they're unproven and therefore they shouldn't be used at all. Well, give me a break. If we really wanted to save lives in our world, wouldn't we try everything? Shouldn't we try colloidal silver on some patients and see if it works? And shouldn't we compare the results of colloidal silver treatments versus a vaccine treatment versus a a nutrient therapy versus vitamin D or sunshine therapy versus, you know, who knows what else, infrared uh, treatments or something. You, you, shouldn't you try everything that's available instead of just limiting your, your tools to only drugs, pharmaceuticals, vaccines? Of course you should try everything. But that's not the way our global medical system is set up. It is set up to, by default, condemn anything that doesn't make money for the drug companies. And that's why every pandemic in our world is now a very grave threat to humanity because of the monopolistic criminality of the modern medical system that absolutely refuses to look at natural medicine, absolutely refuses to prescribe nutritional therapies such as vitamin D. And in fact, our medical system condemns anything that competes with the profits of the, of the drugs and the vaccines and the chemotherapy, come to think of it. So there may be cures right out there, right out your back door, literally in your backyard. You might have dandelions growing out there. Dandelion leaf or dandelion root may actually have uh, antiviral properties that could cure Ebola. 
We'll never know, though, because the medical system won't test dandelion versus Ebola. It won't test uña de gato, a cat's claw herb from the rainforest, which is also a powerful antiviral. They will never test that versus Ebola because they don't want to see that that would work. They'll never test colloidal silver because they don't want to see it work. If the news gets out that colloidal silver could cure Ebola, potentially, then, oh my God, uh, no one would need the vaccine. No one would need the drug. So they won't even test colloidal silver because they don't want to see it work. Hospitals which are dominated by Western medicine, really, when it comes to pandemic disease, they're a one-trick pony. They've only got one trick. It's vaccines. And if that trick doesn't work, they, they don't know what to do. They throw their hands up in the air and say, I don't know. What are we going to do? They don't know. And it's a shame because there's so much medicine in our world. There's medicine all around you. If you go out walking in the forest or walking in the desert or walking uh, even uh, on a beach and you've got the ocean out there, there's medicine in all of these places all around us. But our modern system of, of profit-based medicine doesn't want to find those cures in plants, doesn't want to publicize that they're even out there, doesn't want people to know that they're available, and they sure don't want to test anything against a pandemic. They sure don't want to ever have a, a plant become a hero when the, it, it's supposed to be from their point of view, it's supposed to be, well, the pharmaceutical scientists are supposed to be the heroes. We're supposed to prop up the inventor of the next amazing drug. That's supposed to be the hero. Man overcomes nature. That's supposed to be the story that gets broadcast on the evening news. Not that nature balances nature itself. You see, there's a paradigm at stake here. If people come to believe that there are medicines found in plants that can save lives, then, oh my God, the entire house of cards of modern medicine comes crashing down because the delusion collapses. The delusion that you can only get medicine from a pharmaceutical or via prescription, that only pharmacies sell medicine. Actually, you can get medicine right out your back door. In fact, there's, if you walk around in nature, in a natural park somewhere, Almost everything around you is some form of medicine. Even the bark on the trees is medicine. Many Chinese medicines are made from various tree barks, which contain unique chemical constituents that have astounding properties, curative properties and preventive properties. Leaves are medicine. Plants have to create their own medicine for the simple reason that they don't have legs and they can't walk down to the pharmacy and buy drugs from the drug companies. So they got to make their own drugs themselves. Every plant makes antibiotics. Otherwise, the plant's roots would be eaten by the soil microbes. So every plant that is still alive, by definition, has to be manufacturing its own self-preserving chemical constituents or natural medicines that keep its roots alive and keep its leaves and stems alive or whatever parts it has, flowers, vegetables, fruits, whatever. Every plant manufactures its own medicine. So if we as humans just had the wisdom to tap into that natural medicine that was being grown all around us for free with no patents on it, then we could save ourselves from almost any pandemic, I believe. So if, if here's the lesson in this. Here's the, the, the wisdom that needs to come out of this. If humanity is wiped out by a pandemic virus, Humanity can't blame anyone but itself because the cures are all around us. They're everywhere around you in the natural environment, but humans are too short-sighted, too politically corrupt, too corrupted by business and profit to embrace the natural medicine that exists by God and Mother Nature on our planet for free. And if we die, we die from ignorance of the natural medicine that really exists out there in the real world. And my goal with this course is to help people stay alive through knowledge and wisdom. So that's why I will be discussing the antiviral plants that are readily available right now. Some of them you can grow yourself. Some of them you can purchase right now uh, over the counter as plant extracts or nutritional supplements. I'm going to go into those in an upcoming episode of this course. So thank you for listening. Spread the word. This is biodefense.com, the pandemic preparedness course. My name is Mike Adams, the health ranger. I'm the editor of naturalnews.com. Stay informed and you'll stay alive.